uh, Dr. Eugene, since uh, Prof. Effendi uh, will be late or cannot join us, we can just start now lah, since Prof. Najmi has have ready, Dr. Najmi is ready lah. Okay, uh, Dr. Najmi, uh, if you're okay, we can start, yeah? Yeah, all right, great. Take a second. Okay. Uh, good evening to everyone in attendance. Thank you for joining us on a lovely Thursday evening. So we are currently in our final week of uh, the Gastroenterology Month in January, organized by the College of Physicians of Malaysia. Um, I do apologize on behalf of Prof. Rajat Fendi, our chairperson, as he has got a meeting to attend to. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I would like to start by introducing our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Kairul Najmi Muhammad Nawawi. He's currently a consultant physician, gastroenterologist and hepatologist in Hospital Chancellor Tuan Kumuris, uh, UKM. He was trained uh, purely in Ireland, obtained his undergraduate degree from the National University of Ireland in 2009, subsequently completed his MRCP in 2014. After that, uh, he was trained as a gastroenterology registrar for five years while working in teaching hospitals in Ireland. And during that time, also pursued a Master's of Science in Clinical Research and was awarded the Master's in 2017. Um, he came back to Malaysia in 2017 and subsequently completed his fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology um, from the Ministry of Health uh, and also UKM Malaysia. So currently, he is involved in clinical care of patients and also in teaching undergraduate and postgraduate students. And he does a lot of uh, clinical research as well. So with that, Dr. Nanshmi, I would like to pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eugene, for the kind introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And a very good afternoon to everyone uh, in the Zoom. Uh, let me share my slide first. All right. Okay. Um, thank you again uh, to College of Physician Malaysia for uh, the invitation uh, for me to be here, uh, mainly to talk, to present, to discuss on um, uh, a topic in gastroenterology, inflammatory bowel disease, which is not uncommon, but again, uh, probably not uh, not uh, so familiar uh, with the rest of uh, physicians or doctors, uh, especially in Malaysia. So um, I would like to uh, give a, a brief talk on uh, IBD at lungs, and then we're going to go through um, different between UC and CD, does it really matter? Um, then we look at the IBD mimics and a few common mistakes in the management of IBD. And then after that, I would like to open the floor to the rest. If you have any question that I can answer, I will try my best. So a bit of introduction, as uh, you all know, IBD comprised of ulcerative colitis and also Crohn's disease. Uh, it is a lifelong, frequently debilitating, and usually inflammatory condition. And it's characterized by period of active disease when you have a flare, uh, usually alternated with a period of remission. And this happened to most of uh, IBD patients. And it definitely can significantly impair the quality of life of the patient. And most of the time, patients will require prolonged medical plus minus surgical intervention along the, the course of the disease. If we look at the, the old data in terms of the, the clinical cause of a UC patient, majority of them usually have um, uh, acute uh, flare or acute active disease during the initial presentation. But majority of them over time uh, will go into remission and subsequently might have a, a, a a flare, but less intense or less active compared to the initial one. And about one third of the patient, uh, they usually have a chronic intermittent symptom, 
uh, where after they go into remission, they might have another flare, which uh, either the same intensity as the first one or even worse from the worst one. And when uh, they've been treated uh, during the acute flare and then goes into the remission, subsequently happen uh, another relapse. So about one third of the patient might have a chronic intermittent symptom. Small proportion of, of the patient might have chronic continuous symptom where they do not really achieve complete or at least clinical remission. And therefore they have uh, underlying inflammation uh, with varying degree of uh, severity of the inflammation. And then about 1% of them might have um, uh, increase in the severity after initial uh, period of low activity of uh, inflammation. So in UC, uh, as we know, it's exclusively involved uh, colon, do not or doesn't involve the, the proximal bowel and also the upper GI. And then the symptom uh, predominantly uh, categorized by rectal bleeding due to the fibrin mucosa of the colon. They also can have mucus per rectum, usually associated with diarrhea and abdominal pain. And usually uh, if the symptom happen uh, over a few weeks or months, they will have a systemic symptom, which include fever, weight loss, and anemia. Over a longer period of time, usually over eight to 10 years, there will be increased risk of colorectal cancer. And in aggressive cause of UC, usually it happened in younger patient and with extensive colonic involvement. How about Crohn's? Uh, in contrast to UC, it can affect any part of GI tract from anus to esophagus. And usually the distribution of the inflammation will be patchy or that what we call skip lesion. The symptom varies according to the site of um, affected a GI tract, if it affect the colon, more or less the same as you see, abdominal pain, diarrhea, blood per rectum, mucus, and if it affect the small bowel, so mainly abdominal pain, loose stool with no blood per rectum, and sometimes with a bowel obstruction symptom if they have a stricture. And some or probably a majority of the patient who have delayed presentation, they can present with complication, for example, uh, partial or complete bowel obstruction uh, or intra-abdominal uh, abscess due to the penetrating disease or fistula even. A uh, majority of Crohn's disease probably will require surgery at some point. And then in aggressive uh, type of Crohn's disease, usually it happen in younger age at the onset, usually in active smoker, and it can involve the, the upper GI site, especially the small bowel, and also the perianal region. Bear in mind, they also can present concomitantly with uh, extra intestinal manifestation of IBD, uh, from our medical school, we know from the textbook, it can affect the, the eyes in terms of uveitis, scleritis. It can affect uh, the liver, primary sclerosis cholangitis in UC. It can uh, affect the skin, erythema nodosum, pyroma gangrenosum, sweet disease. Uh, it can cause malnutrition. And uh, uh, most frequent EIM in patients with IBD uh, is... Uh, joint pain or arthritis, uh, where we group into the uh, group called spondyloarthropathies, uh, which a group of several diseases with similar clinical, radiologic, serologic features include ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, and then the one that associated with IBD, that usually we call enteropathic or IBD-associated spondyloarthropathies. So about uh, probably about 30 to 40 percent patient will have um, arthritis or symptom that affecting the joint. We can categorize categorize further uh, for the IBD associated spondyloarthropathies into peripheral arthritis and also axial arthropathies. Peripheral arthritis have type one and type two. Axial 
can be divided into isolated sarcoelitis, inflammatory back pain, and also ankylosing spondylitis. So a bit uh, description in terms of the peripheral arthritis, type 1 palsy articular using less than 5 joint, mainly large joint, but more at the, at the knee, ankle, wrist, and elbow. Usually is asymmetrical involvement as compared to type 2 polyarticular, usually 5 or more, mainly small joint at the hand uh, and the knee. And then it can be symmetrical or asymmetrical and usually bilateral. For the type 1, usually the, the, it, it comes parallel with the IBD disease activity. That means when patients have flare, usually they will complain of joint pain uh, in the last joint mainly. However, in type 2, uh, usually it independent of the IBD disease. Therefore, if we treat the underlying IBD, it might not improve the type 2 uh, peripheral arthritis symptom. Um, Type 1 can happen uh, with either EIM, and, but type 2 usually accepted only with the UVIs. These are some diagram and picture of the extraintestinal manifestation of IBD. Uh, you can see aptus ulcer at the lips. B, you can see the, the erythematous, uh, lightly tender nodule uh, at the skin uh, in sweet disease. A C again, um, erythema nodosum, tender uh, bullseye lesion at the shin, and D, description of pyoderma gangnosum, uh, similar to E around the stoma site, and then F and G is the eye um, manifestation, H, R, G, and K affecting the joint the bamboo spine in ankylosing spondylitis, as well as the sarcoelitis. So let me touch a bit on the prevalence of IBD in terms of the global prevalence. Um, it it, uh, it shows uh, north to south gradient as well as west to east gradient, uh, whereas the incident is more common in northern country and the western country. So for example, North America, UK, Northern Europe, and also Australia. How about in Asia Pacific? Um, apart from Australia, uh, the incident is, is relatively uh, high in China, Hong Kong, and Macau. And when we look at the local and uh, data from our four decade analysis of incident trend IBD in UKM Medical Center. Uh, we have seen increase in S, uh, incident in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, and including uh, in, in the numbers of UC patients and also Bronze disease patients. And when we look at the prevalence according to the ethnicity, it's most common or most prevalent in the Indian uh, patient uh, for UC and also for Crohn's disease. Let's have a look uh, on the socio-demographic characteristic of our cohort. Uh, both UC and Crohn's are more prevalent in, slightly more prevalent in male as compared to female. In terms of the duration of the disease, mainly our patients have uh, uh, short uh, disease, less than five years. And the mean age of diagnosis, Crohn's disease patients tend to be slightly younger, around 27 years of age while UC has been diagnosed around 40 years of age. In terms of the disease characteristic, uh, in UC patient, uh, majority of them have left-sided and also extensive colitis. Left-sided mean inflammation in the colon from rectum up to the descending colon. Extensive mean uh, including the spinal fracture and beyond, probably in the thrombus colon. And then Crohn's disease, uh, majority of them have iliocolonic distribution involved with the ileum and also the right side of the colon. And about 12 or 13% of them uh, have a perianal disease as well. Uh, in terms of the behavior of the Crohn's disease, majority of them have inflammatory rather than suturing or penetrating disease. What are the risk factors uh, for IBD? 
again, that, uh, there is no single uh, risk factor. Usually, it's combined genetic and environmental factors in terms of the family history. In the Western population, it's been shows that um, uh, familial aggregation among IBD is, is quite common and quite high, about 10 to 25%. However, in Asian IBD patients, it's slightly less common. Uh, our data show about 1.7%. And the rest of the Asian country around uh, two to three percent. There are a lot of uh, IBD specific genetic loci has been identified, but probably the, the, the strongest association is the NOT2, uh, which is associated with IBD in uh, patient patient, especially in Crohn's disease. Other factors, as I said, environment triggers usually. Anything in our life, uh, starting from early life events such as birth, breastfeeding, exposure to antibiotic, infection, and then towards a later childhood, teenager, and then elder life, all those things can affect uh, the pathogenesis of the IBD, which include um, a microbiota as well in our body. How about the three factors? Again, uh, a systemic review uh, of um, uh, most of them, uh, a cohort uh, or retrospective study has shown that um, high dietary intakes of total fat, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid, omega-6 fatty acid, and meat, uh, they have a slightly risk, high risk of uh, IBD, while people taking high fiber, High fruit intake and vegetable have a decreased risk of CD and UC. Smoking. Uh, in Western study, definitely smoking is a consistent factor associated with IBD. It increases the risk of Crohn's disease, but is a protective effect in UC. Therefore, it reduces the risk of UC. However, in our population, uh, in, in Asian uh, population, uh, the association is not so impactful. Uh, study in Hong Kong and Korea didn't show a, a good association between smoking and Crohn's disease. In contrast, uh, it did show a protective effect of smoking against UC. As you can see in the table 2 and 4, uh, whereby the risk of developing Crohn's uh, UC, associative colitis, is much lower if they smoke. Uh, you can see the odd ratio for the smoker is quite high, 4.3. And in the table four, in the multivariate analysis, in the ad smoker, which is not smoking anymore, uh, the risk of uh, UC is very high with odd ratio of 6.2. So uh, there are a few guidelines, consensus that, that you can read and refer to in SR specific uh, region. We have IBD working group in Asia Pacific. So uh, usually this guideline will, will be published in the Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Uh, there are a few consensus on UC, on Crohn's disease, and uh, in terms of the, the tuberculosis and also the breast practice of immunomodulator and bio biologic agent. So you can look up uh, into the journal as well. Okay, so how do we diagnose IBD? It's very important diagnosis of UC and CD is based on combination of clinical endoscopic histological features and the exclusion of infectious etiology. Because in our region, the prevalent, the incidence of um, tropical infection is quite high. Therefore, it's important to exclude infectious etiology before we contribute the symptom or the inflammation due to IBD. And there is no single test to diagnose, but need to combine a few features that are available from the clinical history, physical examination, biochemical, um, serology, endoscopic, histology, stool test, and probably image as well. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, IBD uh, mucus, uh, for example, intestinal TB, infection in Campylobacter jejunum, and also infectious colitis, such as uh, uh, Clostridium difficile. 
So all can show inflammation in the colon. Uh, they might be similar endoscopically and histologically. So in terms of endoscopy, when we do a, a colonoscopy of a UC patient, we can see a few changes. Uh, this is the, the endoscopic score to stratify the severity of uh, colonic inflammation. Uh, normal mucosa, as you can see on the left uh, box, very nice, smooth, normal vascular pattern. In mild disease, endoscopically, there will be slightly red. The vascular pattern is reduced and the mucosa will be slightly friable, easy to bleed. In the moderate, uh, as you can see a lot more erosion, more uh, erythematous mucosa. And then in severe disease, they will have a spontaneous spreading and you see a lot of uh, ulcer as well. In Crohn's disease, uh, the endoscopic uh, appearance uh, might be similar to UC, especially if it's, it's only involved the colon or the left side of the colon. But there are some features that might indicate more towards Crohn's disease, for example, evidence of uh, adverse ulcer, and then a skip lesion, uh, probably a deeper longitudinal ulcer, and also cobblestone appearance after a long standing inflammation. Histologically, uh, again, sometimes difficult to differentiate UC from CD just from the histopathology, but there are a few features that might suggest, for example, uh, the most discriminant features that favor in UC is the diffuse creep abnormality within sample or between the sites, for example, between the rectum, thrombus colon, and the cecum. Uh, other helpful finding from the histopathology include Crips atrophy, abnormal crip architecture, widespread cryptitis, severe mucin depletion with absence of alien inflammation. There are some features uh, from the histopathology that favor Crohn's disease. And the most reliable features is granuloma, which is non casetting usually microgranuloma. And then um, other features include uh, focal or fatigue, uh, chronic inflammation, uh, focal creep distortion with ileal involvement, absence of other features of UC. So how do we treat um, IBD? Uh, again, you need to remember the treatment strategy is first is to induce the remission and number two is to maintain the remission seems like other uh, chronic inflammatory disease traditionally the aim for uh, treatment for ibd mainly to control the clinical symptom uh, hopefully that will improve the quality of life and then try to induce the remission uh, probably a bit short-term goal but now with the era of immunomodulator, biological therapy, we should aim for mucosal healing, ideally endoscopic, eventually probably go to the histological remission and yeah, go and then uh, into the deep remission as well. And eventually, hopefully, with the aim of the deep remission, uh, we can reduce the risk of complication and change the course of the disease. So assessment of the disease activity is very important. There are a few domain of the disease activity assessment. As I said earlier, number one, clinical symptom, very important. Number two, we want to assess the burden of the current inflammation, which can be determined by biomarkers, usually CRP or ESR. And we can look at the full blood count, look for any evidence of chronic anemia or iron deficiency. Usually in active disease, they will have uh, reactive thrombocytosis. And then from the uh, renal profile, look at the albumin. They might have uh, hypoalbuminemia, either secondary to the uh, malnutrition or chronic disease. And uh, apart from the blood tests, um, if you have the, the availability to do fecal uh, testing, uh, we can do fecal protecting, uh, which indicate a chronic inflammation. 
and then uh, from endoscopy uh, is, is, is the gold standard way to assess inflammation. So we can take biopsy and then confirm histologically. And then from the imaging, uh, either intestinal ultrasound or CT scan or MRI. And then, of course, uh, in terms of uh, activity assessment, the quality of life of the patient is very important. So these are some uh, validated scoring system that we can use uh, to assess clinical activity disease from the clinical symptom. For UC, you can use Mayo score or UCDAI score. And then I'm sure everyone quite familiar with true love and with criteria, usually used to assess severity of ulcerative colitis, where the patient is having mild flare, moderate flare or severe flare, depend on the clinical uh, blood tests and vital signs as well. And this is for a Crohn's disease. We can use uh, Crohn's disease activity, CDI score. You need to use calculator for this one. And then another score that you can use is Harvey Bradshaw index. So all this uh, index assessment, endoscopic assessment is very important because the aim for the treatment of IBD is to treat the target. Uh, we should have a uh, uh, short-term target intermediate target, long-term target. And then if we think the target is not reached, we need to escalate the treatment, need to reassess if needed, and then so that we can achieve uh, long-term uh, remission for the patient. So short-term target, usually uh, we want uh, to make the patient feel better. So we should aim uh, clinical improvement uh, over the next uh, few weeks, usually within one month. And then for the intermediate target, we want the resolution or improvement of the biochemical, usually a CRP, uh, probably hemoglobin, patient with anemia, and fecal coprotectin if you have the facility. And this should be obtained within three months uh, of uh, from the initial flare. And the long-term target, about six to 12 months, uh, we should repeat the endoscopy, to measure or to document any healing of the mucosa. Why is very important to tweak to target? Because uh, as you can see uh, the graph for the Crohn's disease, the progression of the uh, disease uh, from the onset uh, and then uh, into the diagnosis, early diagnosis. So as, as the times go on without a proper treatment, uh, there will be more damage to the GI tract, which causing complication. So initially it might be just inflammation and then develop stricture, fistula, and then penetrating disease, which causes abscess. Eventually we need surgery and then there will be uh, another stricture ongoing. So this is the natural history of Crohn's disease. So there will be a, 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 a so-called windows of opportunity during the early diagnosis or early disease to treat properly, to control the, the disease, the flare, so that it won't develop uh, into the more severe uh, complication. The same goes to assertive colitis. Um, there will be a window of opportunity uh, around the diagnosis and early uh, disease uh, progression. Uh, if we didn't treat properly, it might lead to uh, more uh, uh, damage or inflammation of the colon, which causing uh, complications such as stricture, dysmotility, and erectile dysfunction. And eventually, there will be increased risk of uh, adverse outcomes such as malignancy and also uh, having a surgery. In terms of the treatment algorithm, uh, we have a pyramid uh, of the treatment. Traditionally, what we call step up approach or step up therapy, uh, we start uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, the, the least potent but the, the, the most safe uh, medication. Uh, we use a 5 ASA, the Salazin, uh, brand name include Pentasa Salofac. Uh, we can use, uh, for example, to induce a mild to moderate uh, active uh, assertive colitis. 
And if still not adequate, we still can use a corticosteroid. And then uh, for the remission, for the to maintain the remission, we can introduce immunosuppressant or immunomodulator, for example, azathioprine. And then if we think there's still lack of uh, healing or improvement, uh, we can add on biological therapy. I eventually might need a surgery. And then there's another approach. We call it top-down. Uh, from the top of the pyramid going down. Usually we, uh, we, we do this approach in a moderate to severe uh, IBD patient uh, where we uh, try to induce uh, the remission by uh, IV steroid uh, and then monitor for a few days. If not improving, uh, this is a role of uh, biologic therapy, usually anti f to induce the remission quickly. And then after that, uh, once the patient is more stable, and then probably we slowly uh, introduce the immunosuppressant. In terms of the local treatment algorithm, uh, you can uh, Google and then follow um, uh, this guideline produced by MSGH uh, treatment algorithm for inflammatory bowel disease. I will touch on a few things. Uh, so in terms of management of acute severe ulcerative colitis, uh, we should remember this is sort of medical emergency. Patient usually have a toxic colitis coming looking toxic and there's an increased risk of complication such as perforation and uh, severe bleeding. So this will require hospital admission uh, apart uh, of uh, usual uh, focal history and examination. Patient should have a plain abdomen uh, radiograph to assess any evidence of complications such as toxic agapolon. And then eventually, uh, uh, if you have the facility, patient will need a, a unprepared uh, flexible simodoscopy just to confirm the inflammation, take biopsy to rule out co-existing CMV infection. Stool, very important, need to send for CNS and also CD toxin. And usually you will need a, a combined close uh, surgical and medical management at this stage. Um, if no surgical intervention, medical treatment, of course, need to start on intravenous hydrocortisone, 100 mg QID. Uh, make sure you have a DVT prophylaxis antibiotic if you think there is coexisting sepsis, and make sure adequate hydration. And then daily monitoring of the patient is very important clinically. Uh, need to look at the heart rate, need to look at the uh, any temperature. Uh, look at the stool chart, make sure it's become less. And then look at the CRP as well. Uh, if there is an inadequate response after three days, uh, that means patient need escalation of the therapy, either biologic or probably need a surgical uh, intervention. In patient who have adequate response with intravenous steroid, that can be changed to oral prednisolone, 40 mg, and then tapered every week uh, up to zero. Uh, in view of the uh, long-term steroid, patient should be put on calcium and vitamin D. Uh, usually after a few days or weeks after the initial flare, we will start on immunomodulator as well as a therapy. And that um, assessment every three months to uh, six months after that is needed. And then along the assessment, if we think the, the response is still inadequate, inadequate uh, we might need to introduce biologic therapy. In Crohn's disease with peri fistulizing disease, so slightly different the management, uh, patient with peri fistulizing disease, it's important to assess the complexity of the uh, uh, fistula uh, ideally should be done by pelvic MRI or sometimes with uh, endoanal uh, or anorectal uh, ultrasound and then um, might need to do chronoscopy to assess the luminal disease. In simple fistula, antibiotic uh, is, is enough. In complex, might need a ceton for drainage. Antibiotic is a must, usually slightly prolonged, can be up to three months. Uh, and then um, 
there might be a role uh, of uh, uh, immunomodulator, but eventually patient uh, with complex perianal fistulizing disease, they will need a biological therapy, usually anti F uh, treatment. Uh, please remember in active, uh, active uh, fistula disease, uh, try to avoid steroid. Uh, there is no role uh, of closing the fistula or treating the abscess. In fact, it might increase risk of uh, infection or increase risk of sepsis uh, if we combine steroid with antibiotic. Uh, and then, uh, of course, subsequent management need to reassess to monitor to respond, and then, as I said, might consider uh, anti F is the response to load. At the moment, in Malaysia or in 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 in, in in Malaysia, currently available biologic, uh, we have a few. Uh, the, the oldest one is uh, anti F alpha in Frizimab. It can be given for UC and uh, CD. And then second line, we have Vidolizumab, which is anti uh, integrin And then uh, another one is Stekinumab, anti IL-12 and top 3 So, um, in general, um, uh, infrizumab, uh, anti F is very good in terms of the induction. Uh, patient feel uh, better after a few days of the first infusion. Uh, it's good in uh, fistulizing disease, so uh, it's more efficient as compared to other biologic. Uh, however, the safety profile probably not the best because it can increase the risk of reactivation of uh, latent TB or chronic hepatitis B and uh, risk of malignancy as well. Uh, when we look at the right side of the table, for example, bedolizumab, up, they have a good safety profile. Uh, bedolizumab is um, anti integrin so it act locally at the gut. It didn't affect the systemic. Uh, so uh, if the patient have uh, history of risk for TB activation or recurrent infection. So with the Lizumab and Estigamab is probably the best choice. Uh, bear in mind that with the Lizumab, uh, have a slightly uh, longer period uh, to induce uh, the uh, remission. So usually patient probably have to wait for a few months before feeling the effects from the with When we see a patient, uh, risk stratification is very important uh, so that we can identify patient uh, with uh, risk of poor prognosis. In this patient, they probably will benefit uh, to start the, the biologic therapy early. For example, predictors for poor outcome in Crohn's disease include a younger patient who have perianal disease, who need a steroid in the first six months, uh, patients have extensive disease affecting small bowel or upper GI, and also if they have suturing, penetrating behavior, uh, which is the fistula. What's the indication for surgery? First, number one, in a refractory intractable fulminant disease, uh, they might need urgent surgery to prevent more complication. Uh, for example, in toxic megacolon as well, or chronic obstruction. Massive colonic hemorrhage, another uh, possible complication. Sometimes we do um, advise for surgery uh, as a prophylactic for colon cancer, especially from the biopsy or from the endoscopy, it show a dysplasia uh, either low grade or high grade because the risk of cancer over time is there. Okay, give me uh, probably another five minutes. Uh, so why important to define the type of IBD? Because as, as I explained earlier, the two IBD, uh, which is UC and Crohn's disease, they have slightly different natural history. Uh, once we know the UC or CD is important in terms of patient counseling, uh, it can affect our treatment because some drugs are not useful for one type 
for example, mesalazine, good for UC but not for Crohn's disease. And then the surgical option might be different if it's UC rather than CD. And uh, we know in Crohn's disease, the risk of involvement in the small bowel and upper GI. So it's important to assess uh, the upper GI tract in terms of the lilacoat malignancy, uh, quite high in UC if the patient have uh, extensive colitis. And of course, prevalence of complications such as PSC in UC. How do you differentiate between UC and CD? Again, we need to combine clinical history, presentation from the radiology, endoscopic, and also uh, pathology finding. Sometimes a bit difficult to sub maybe because of the suboptimal clinical detail or sampling from the endoscopy, or it might be just early IBD that probably have to wait a few uh, months or years before we can confirm the diagnosis. Sometimes uh, we learn the, the continuous inflammation in the UC, but again, it still can happen in UC. And it can be uh, mistaken for something else, for example, uh, diverticular disease or uh, infectious colitis and so on. So to reduce the risk of misdiagnosis or misclassified, uh, pathologists should insist on full endoscopic and clinical details so that can correlate with the histopathological finding. Clinician endoscopy should take multiple biopsy from multiple sites. And then the best is to have a multidisciplinary meeting between the gastroenterologist, pathologist, and probably with the radiologist as well. So IBD mimics, there are a lot of differential diagnosis, for example, in colitis, apart from IBD, Infectious is very common in our uh, country. TB need to be excluded. Another one is CMV colitis and, and usual salmonella or infectious colitis. And the rest, uh, just good to know. For example, vascular disease, ischemic colitis, radiation colitis, inflammatory, which is associated with diabetes colitis, drug use, important um, cause to remember. For example, NSAID, it can show a more or less similar finding in the endoscopy. And again, neoplasm like lymphoma also is one of the differential as well. In terms of the uh, elitis, again, infection, especially Yersinia infection, TB, uh, inflammatory, appendicitis can cause uh, elitis as well. Gynecological uh, cause, vascular cause, drug in use, and again, at neoplasm. As you can see in this diagram, endoscopically, uh, on the left is Crohn disease, on the right is intestinal TB. Actually, they look probably the same. Uh, a lot of ulcer, it can be thrombus ulcer, uh, it can be longitudinal, and then the ileocecal valve, the most affected site uh, by both, usually look the same. Again, is another endoscopic features of inflamed colon on the left side. So on the left side, um, it's actually amyloidosis. In the middle, patient disease, amyloid colitis, ischemic colitis. So it's very important in terms of the history examination. Look for potential relevant history. History of AFib, for example, ischemic colitis. Uh, over-the-counter uh, medication, any evidence of uh, immunosuppressive therapy, any close contact uh, with TB or TB colitis, and also HIV associated enterocolitis. From the finding, make sure leave not and also look for any ulcer in other area, for example, oral and genital. So to differentiate between Crohn's and TB history, uh, endoscopy, extra sample for TB, PCR, and culture. CT scan might be useful to look for any lymphadenopathy, any finding in the chest. Usually, we send for uh, interferon gamma base test. And then, uh, eventually, after you combine with all the available uh, info, we have to treat the most likely diagnosis. In this case, probably uh, TB or uh, Crohn's. But do not start biologic unless you're confident the diagnosis of TB is very unlikely or has been excluded. 
you can refer to uh, this paper by Prof. Uh, Prof. Ida in UM in terms of uh, algorithm, uh, simplified practical algorithm in differentiating uh, chronic disease from uh, intestinal TB. Uh, it's a nice diagram you can follow and eventually you should treat based on your uh, most likely differential diagnosis. Even if you're not sure, you think it's 50-50, probably better to treat the TB and then reassess in, 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 in three months uh, by endoscopy and see any response or not. Okay, my last few slide, uh, a few mistake, common mistake in uh, management of IBD. Number one, use of 5-ASA or mesalazine to maintain remission in patients with Crohn's disease. So please remember, uh, mesalazine uh, is useful for UC, but no role in Crohn's disease. Uh, some people might still using that in Crohn's colitis uh, patient, uh, but uh, my my personal preference or my personal experience, I uh, usually uh, it's no use. So for Crohn's disease, uh, for the maintenance, uh, you can adopt for azathioprine rather than PSA. Mistake number two regarding surgery as an outcome indicative of failure again. Uh, although we, we usually put surgery as a last resort of a treatment, but it's not an indicator of failure. Uh, Sometimes you might offer the surgery early, especially if the patient has, uh, for example, uh, isolated uh, terminal area disease uh, uh, with no evidence of uh, obstruction. So rather than... Uh, subjected the patient to lifelong uh, or long-term biologic for the short terminal illness disease. Patient might just go for resection and then monitor after that. Mistake number three, overuse of corticosteroid. Again, we are aiming for endoscopic healing, not just clinical uh, remission. Although steroid is very useful in inducing clinical remission, but we know a lot of side effects from the steroid. After the initial course of steroid for about two months, uh, need to put patient on maintenance, non-steroid uh, spiring agent, uh, regular follow-up if it's no improvement, and then escalate to the biologic therapy. Uh, once patient need to be uh, given steroid for the flare, uh, two or more in a year, that's when patient need escalation of the treatment. Mistake number four, delaying biologic therapy in the case of perianal Crohn's disease with such good remission. So after uh, uh, perianal Crohn's disease patient being uh, successfully treated for the abscess or drain, uh, need to start on biologic therapy early uh, so that it can control the fistula in the long term. Number five, inadequate anticoagulation prophylaxis for uh, DVT. So, um, uh, Veno, uh, venous thromboembolic disease is quite common in IBD patient. Uh, is is actually the 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 predictor for uh, morbidity and mortality in IBD patient. And therefore, any patient being hospitalized, especially, uh, need to consider for prophylaxis. Although patient coming with uh, GI bleeding. Uh, but it's safe to give the uh, prophylactic dose of uh, anticoagulant. And mistake number six, inappropriate endoscopic surveillance in patients with IBD. Please remember, uh, surveillance is necessary uh, in terms of the risk of colorectal cancer in general population, about 1 in 33. But in UC patient, as compared to general population, the risk is higher, especially they, if they have a severe colitis or pancolitis. So uh, the first surveillance chronoscopy should be offered to the patient at the year, at the eight years after the first uh, diagnosis. Subsequently, it depends on the risk group, whether it's high risk group, intermediate, low, or low, uh, or uh, background. So in a high risk patient, for example, if they have uh, suture or dysplasia, they need to have every year uh, scope including the one who have concomitant PSC. In patients who still have extensive colitis with active inflammation, 
or family history of colorectal cancer. So in this group, they need to have annual uh, colonoscopy. In intermediate risk group, if they have um, uh, probably moderate uh, inflammation uh, with evidence of some post-inflammatory polyps uh, with the family history of colorectal cancer, so they need to have a scope every two to three years. If low risk, for example, they are in remission, well controlled with medication, so they can be offered for endoscopy every five years. If they only have prophylactic or probably Crohn's involving one segment, so no surveillance colonoscopy is required. I think with that, I would like to end my session. Um, I pass the mic back to Dr. Eugene. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Najmi, for the very insightful talk. I believe it was a very enlightening session um, covering first the epidemiology to IBD, subsequently also progressing on to one or two questions here at the moment. Um, first one would be, okay, yeah. So after the patient develops, starts to develop symptoms, um, how long will it take before you can get findings on the endoscopy. I, I believe that's what the first question is asking. It means is there any lag time from development of symptoms to uh, endoscopic findings? Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the question, very relevant. Um, again, it's difficult to determine because uh, usually it's, it's depend on uh, duration of the symptom that patient have. Um, in IBD patient, uh, usually they have insidious uh, cause of uh, disease or symptom. Usually they have a symptom probably for about two or three months before seeing you. Uh, initially, just a bit of uh, abdominal discomfort and then a bit of loose stool two or three times a day. Eventually, progressively get worse, uh, start to uh, lose appetite starts to lose weight and then probably have a bit of mucus and corrective breathing. So uh, if we do the scope uh, at the first two or three weeks uh, of that case, for example, when patient just having a bit of abdominal pain and one or two times the stool, the endoscopic features might not be so prominent. So endoscopic features, if we scope, we might just see, for example, a bit of loss of normal vascular pattern. Probably no ulcer, probably no um, uh, fibro mucosa. Uh, but if we scope a uh, patient probably three months after the first symptom, and uh, by that time they have a bit of more loose stool on and off bleeding. So that is the time where the endoscopic feature is most likely to show uh, the finding of uh, IBD endoscopic feature. This is quite different from, for example, uh, acute colitis uh, or self-limiting colitis, usually from infectious, where patient suddenly develop a profuse or a quite severe uh, loose stool or bloody diarrhea for the last two or three days. And then when we scope at that time, definitely we'll see the uh, inflammation col uh, colon colitis ulcer. But again, we have to tally with our clinical presentation. The duration is very short, two or three days, but it's already so severe. So a bit unlikely to be IBD. That's where you need to think it could be infectious uh, rather than IBD. Right. So basically, it's more of um, the severity of the symptoms will probably dictate how early you get the endoscopic findings. Yeah. Um. A second question would be, um, a patient who has got spondyloarthropathy, who is currently on biologics for almost two years and subsequently starts to develop a uh, GI symptoms, which is intermittent colic and diarrhea for two months. However, a colonoscopy done is not significant. Um. In this scenario, can we rule out IBD reliably? Thank you, Ken, for the next question. Again, um, difficult for me to 100% answer the, the, the short history, but you have to look uh, at, uh, 
to look uh, to have a bigger picture on this case the risk of a concomitant ibd is there uh, because patient have rheumatoid uh, rheumatoid uh, disease uh, again uh, detailed history need to be taken. We need to know how long patient have uh, uh, the, the, the GI uh, symptom. What type of GI symptom? Is it just uh, abdominal pain uh, in terms of the diarrhea? Is it is it a true loose stool? Is it a true uh, increase in bowel frequency? Uh, any other associated symptom? For example, uh, skin lesion, eye symptom, uh, adverse ulcer, uh, any other joint pain, uh, family history, and so forth. And then in terms of investigation, uh, you can look at the biomarkers, uh, look at the inflammatory uh, markers. Uh, if you think patient being controlled for the uh, atropities, uh, but having a GI symptom, so the patient probably still have a bit of low-grade inflammation. So CRP or ESR might be slightly raised, although it's not uh, very, very high. And then in terms of other investigation, uh, fecal carpotectin is quite good, non-invasive. Uh, you can see uh, any evidence of uh, colon inflammation. And then the scope, uh, chronoscopy, is perfectly normal. Make sure, first chronoscopy, make sure it's go into the terminal ileum, uh, regardless we think UC or Crohn's. Uh, if that's chronoscopy is normal, uh, make sure biopsy is taken as well because we know in early IBD, endoscopic features might not be so uh, obvious. Uh, by taking a segmental biopsy, for example, in ileum, cecum, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and rectum, it might show low-grade inflammation, which might indicate early IBD. Uh, so uh, apart from the colon, if you think... Uh, it might be a Crohn's disease, for example. So we need to assess to evaluate the small bowel as well. And some of the modality that we can use, uh, probably uh, MRI is the best, MRI enterography, uh, sometimes capsule endoscopy to look at the mucosal lining. So uh, a summary, uh, need to fully assess, uh, not cannot base just on one uh, or two modalities. And uh, usually, patient will need follow up to see any progression of the symptom uh, before we uh, really be conclude that is no IBD or whether there is an IBD. Sure. All right. Thanks, Dr. Ajmi. Um, if I may, just one final question only. Um, um, I believe because a lot of patients with IBD, they are probably at the reproductive age group. So if let's say you do encounter a patient with IBD in pregnancy, um, any differences in the principles of management in just very briefly? Thank you, Eugene, for the important question. In general, similar uh, uh, protocol or similar principle, we need to make sure uh, the inflammation is, let's say if the patient have flare during the pregnancy, we need to induce the remission and then to maintain because it can affect the mother and also the baby. In terms of the safety of the medication, uh, most uh, of the medication are safe. We still can use steroid. We still can use immunomodulator. Even we still can use biologic therapy if needed. In some case where patient is on remission, very well get pregnant, probably on biologic or azathioprine, uh, we might hold during the last trimester before the, the delivery. Uh, in terms of counseling of the patient, ideally before patient get pregnant, uh, we should counsel the, 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 the young patient uh, to control their disease before try to get pregnant. And then, um, once they get pregnant, ideally not try not to stop the medication because patient can get flat and that might uh, complicate the, the cause of the disease during pregnancy. Great. Uh, thank you so much for, for the answer. Um, with that, I believe uh, there are no more further questions um, and it's 4 p.m. right now. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Najmi, for spending your evening with us again and for enlightening us. Uh, we appreciate your time and and also for educating us 
So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ashmi. Thanks. Thanks, Afik. Thank you to Eugene. Thank you to Ashmi.